Uh, worked at Los Alamos National Labs. Uh, as a physicist? As a physicist, and uh, essentially hired as a senior staff physicist at uh, Area S-4, essentially for what I was told anyway was the uh, United States Navy. Where is S-4? It's about uh, 10, 15 miles south of Groom Lake, about uh, 125 miles north of Las Vegas. How did you get the job? Uh, I really don't want to mention the guy who I got it through, but I was referred uh, to a person at EGNG to drop off my resume to. That's where I was interviewed, though the job is completely unrelated to uh, EGNG. What would they tell you you were going to be doing, or did they take? No, they really didn't tell me till the very end. It was, uh, they said, a job of, a high technology job, something that I'd be very interested in. Okay, so you get hired, and uh, what happens? You fly up there? fly up there. Uh, first day was reading briefings and that sort of thing, and uh, it became evident to me pretty quickly uh, the you know, level of technology they were dealing with, gravitational propulsion and uh, you know, things that science really has only you know, barely touched on. We'll get into the things that you saw in a couple of minutes, but uh, it's been about a little more than, say, three weeks since your identity was made public. We had you on another program a couple of months ago, but using an, an assumed name and had, to, had you in silhouette, but since, since your identity has been made public and since this information has been made public, what's it been like? Uh, what's been the response from people who see you on the street? Oh, the response has been uh, almost all favorable. In fact, everyone that I've run into has been uh, very supportive, uh, very interested. Uh, I, I guess there are just two or three letters. That, uh, from people who don't believe you? Yeah, well, essentially. Uh, responses uh, from other media outlets as well? Yeah. Yeah, that too. And uh, they want interviews? What do they want? Essentially everything, yeah. Uh, radio interviews, TV interviews. Uh, a lot of people want to, you know, dig back into my background and retrace everything. You know, the list is endless. Many of, many of the people who have been calling, calling us as well, are under the impression that, that either you've gone underground or you've been silenced or uh, that we've been silenced by dark, sinister forces. Any, anything like that happened to you so That's far? That's ridiculous. People are always going over the deep end on that. And... Uh, no one's told me, <laughs> other than originally, not to say anything, and I'm sure no one's uh, come forward to you. And but in the beginning, they told you to keep quiet about this. Oh, yeah. It's the uh, most secret program in the United States. In, in what way did they try to, to make sure that you kept your mouth shut? Uh, everything up to death threats. I mean, constant reminders of it, uh, signing away my constitutional rights uh, for, for fair trial and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and since since this thing has uh, your your phone's been tapped, you believe? Yeah, I believe. Do you know? I have a well, I have a tap detector, and uh, just occasionally after I pick up the phone, you know, a little red light goes on. And and the reason you came forward with the information to begin with is it related to the fact that they were bothering you? Yeah, it was essentially to stop that. And uh, what had happened was I sent in a, a request for my birth certificate. And it, as it turned out, it wasn't there anymore. They said I, I wasn't born at the hospital, and that kind of got me wondering what was going on. So I put in a request for some other information, uh, previous jobs, and you know that was also gone. And uh, I thought something had to be done before I disappeared. But uh, the same thing, oh, Los Alamos—they've never heard of you. Yeah. Um, anything happened since since the reports have have, have aired? Uh, they let me know that they're around by doing stupid, childish little things, but uh, nothing serious, no. You were worried about your life, though, for a while there, weren't you? Yeah, that was uh, one of the reasons to come on and, you know, let everything out on the air. It's, uh, it's a level of insurance. You worried anymore? I mean, you had the feeling that you're over the hump and... To some degree, yeah. Do you find that most people really believe you, or they're just, they just want more information? I think a, a lot of people believe what I said, and... Uh, but the majority, I think, do just want more information, too. It, it's a you know, in-depth subject, and you really have to look at everything. Well, let's look at some of the technology you saw. Now, when did you first get the idea? What's the first thing you saw that, that made you convinced that it's not from here? Uh, the first thing with hands-on experience was the antimatter reactor. And explain what that is and how it works and what it does. It's a plate, oh, about 18 inches in diameter with a sphere on top. I think we, we have some tape of it, uh, tape of a model that a friend of yours made. If we want to roll that, you can maybe narrate along. There it is. Okay, inside that tower is uh, a chip of element 115 they just put in there. That's uh, a super heavy element. 
the lid goes on top and as far as any other of the uh, workings of it I, I really don't know you know what's in what's inside the bottom of it the uh, 115 sets up a gravitational field around the top that little waveguide you saw being put on the top that essentially siphons off the gravity wave and that's later amplified in the lower portion of the craft but uh, just in general the whole technology is is virtually unknown. Now we saw the model, we saw the, the pictures of it there. It looks really, really simple, almost too simple to, to actually do anything. Right. Working parts? Uh, none detectable. Essentially what the job was was to back engineer everything where you have a finished product and just to step backwards and find out how it was made or how it can be made with earthly materials. There hasn't been very much progress. Uh, how long do you think they've had this technology up there? It seemed like quite a while, but uh, I really don't know. Now, what could you do with an antimatter generator? I, what does it do? Well, it it converts it converts antimatter. It doesn't convert antimatter. There's an annihilation reaction. It's an extremely powerful reaction, a hundred percent conversion of matter to energy. Unlike a fission or fusion reaction, which is somewhere around eight tenths of one percent confusion. Uh, <laughs> Conversion of matter to energy. I mean, how does it work? What starts the reaction going in that thing? Uh, really, once the 115 is put in, the reaction is initiated. Just automatic? Right. I don't understand. I mean, there's no button to push or anything? No, there's no, there's no button to push or anything. It, uh, apparently, uh, the 115 under bombardment with protons lets out an antimatter particle. Uh, this antimatter particle will react with any matter whatsoever, which I imagine there is some target system inside the reactor. Uh, this in turn releases heat, and somewhere within that system, there is uh, a 100% efficient uh, thermionic generator, essentially a heat to electrical generator in there. Now, how does this, how is this antimatter reactor, how is this connected to a gravity generation that you talked about earlier? Well, that reactor serves two purposes. It provides a tremendous amount of electrical power, and which is almost a byproduct. The gravitational wave is formed at the sphere, and that's through some action of the 115, which uh, the exact action I don't think anyone, is, anyone really knows. Uh, the waveguide siphons off that, that gravity wave, and that's channeled above the top of the disk to the lower part where there are three gravity amplifiers which amplify and direct that gravity wave. In essence, creating their own gravitational field. Their own gravitational field. Uh, you're fairly convinced that science on Earth doesn't have this technology right now. Well, we have it now, I guess, at right. S4, but we didn't create it. Right. Why not? Why couldn't we? The technology's not even, we don't even know what gravity is. I mean, there's, there's just... Uh, well, what is it? What did you learn? What did you learn about what gravity is? Well, gravity is a wave. Uh, there, there are many different theories about uh, wave included. Uh, there's, they've, it's been theorized that uh, gravity is also particles, gravitons, uh, which is also incorrect. But gravity is a wave, uh, the basic wave. They can actually tap off of an element. Why, why that is, I'm not exactly sure. And uh, so you can produce your own gravity. What does that mean? What, what does that allow you to do? Well, that allows you to do virtually anything. Uh, gravity distorts time and space. By doing that, now you're into a different mode of travel, where instead of traveling in a linear method going from point A to B, now you can distort time and space to where you essentially bring the mountain to Mohammed. You almost bring your destination to you without moving. And since you're distorting time, all this takes place in between moments of time. It's a, such a far-fetched concept. But, uh, we're we're going to get into it a little bit more. We're going to take a short break. Stay with us for more of On the Record. <laughs> with Bob Lazar about flying disks, alien technology, and other matters. Uh, now, of course, what the UFO skeptics say is, uh, yeah, there's life out there elsewhere in the universe. It could never come here. It's just too darn far. With the kind of technology you're talking about, it makes th such considerations irrelevant about distance and time and things like that. Exactly, because when, when you are distorting time, there's no longer a normal reference of time. And that's what producing your own gravity does. 
you can go forward or backward in time? Is that what you're saying? No, not essentially. It's, uh, it'd be easier with a model. On the bottom side of the disk are the three gravity generators. When they want to travel to a distant point, the disk turns on its side. The three gravity generators produce a gravitational beam. What they do is they converge the three gravity generators onto a point and use that as a focal point. Then they essentially bring them up to power and pull that point towards the disk. The disk itself will attach onto that point and snap back as they release space back to that point. Now, all this happens in the distortion of time, so time is not incrementing, so the speed is essentially infinite. Uh, we'll get into the disks in a moment, but the first time you saw the antimatter reactor in operation or demonstration, you had a couple of demonstrations. Tell me about that. Uh, the first time I saw it in operation, they just put my, uh, a friend I worked with, Barry, uh, put the fuel in the reactor, put the lid on, as was shown there. Uh, immediately, a gravitational field developed, and he said, feel it. And it felt like uh, you bring two light poles of a magnet together, except you can do that with your hand. And it was fascinating, because that's impossible, except, uh, you know, on something with great mass. And obviously, this is just a, a and it was a, a repulsion field. In fact, we kind of fooled around with it for a little while, and we threw golf balls off it, and, and uh, it was just a really unique thing. And they had, they had some other sort of demonstrations to show you that this is pretty wild stuff, right? Yeah, they did. They were able to channel the field off in a demonstration booth. They uh, uh, created an intense gravitational area, and you began to see a small little black disk form, and that was the bending of a light. Just like a black hole floating around. Yeah, you know, uh, a black hole is a bad analogy, but yeah, essentially. Um, and time, they gave you some kind of demonstration about time involving a candle. Explain how that worked. Yeah, they took a candle and lit it and uh, put it in the distorted gravitational field, which distorts time, and the candle just stood there. It didn't melt or burn. It was, uh, I mean, it was, it was really unbelievable. You had to be floored by seeing all this stuff. Oh, I, I mean, was. I mean, that's why I, I'm kind of laughing about it now, <laughs> because it must sound ridiculous to everyone, but uh, it's, it's just phenomenal. I mean, this is really alien technology. About the 115, we talked a little bit about it in the series of reports. Explain what it is again, and why you believe it could not be manufactured here. Okay, it's a super heavy element, meaning that on the periodic chart, which lists all the elements found on Earth and that can be synthesized, it's, uh, I think the highest element we've synthesized has been about element 106. Now from 103, or actually anything higher than plutonium up, the half-life begins to drop. In other words, the element disintegrates. When you get up to element 106, it's only around for a very small amount of time. Uh, even science today theorizes that up around element 113 to 116, somewhere in there, they should again become stable. This is in fact true. That's what element 115 is. It's a stable element. Uh, to synthesize it would be impossible. The way we synthesize heavy elements is we take uh, a stable element like bismuth or something like that, or plutonium, whatever, put it in an accelerator and bombard it with protons. Uh, essentially, what you're trying to do is plug in protons into the atoms and increase the atomic number. Uh, to do that to the level of element 115 would just take an infinite amount of power and an infinite amount of time. What, could, what kinds of things, what capabilities would a heavy element like this have? I mean, other than producing power, obviously it can produce a lot of power, right? Well, it in itself is not any matter. It uh, just has a unique property of producing it. Uh, any of the other basic properties it has, I'm, I, I really don't know of. But uh, using just the any matter producing property, uh, you're in, the potential for a weapon is staggering, is absolutely staggering. Like, like what? I mean, a pound of it, what could it do? Well, 2.2 .2 pounds is uh, the energy equivalent of 47 10 megaton hydrogen bombs. I mean, it's, it's a good bang, and, and a pound of a super heavy element is, you know, maybe the size of a, you know, a plum or something like that. I guess what I've heard most from the people who just don't buy the whole story is that, uh, sure, maybe you worked at an area called S4, and maybe that it is a secret area, but uh, what you were shown is stuff that we've made that we made this 115, if it is 115, mm -hmm. that we made the flying disks, that we made these antimatter reactors, because these are advances that you just don't know about. Hardly. <laughs> Why not? Uh, it, well, the 115 is impossible. 
I mean, uh, that, that's it. And the fact that the main job of everyone there is to find out how everything's made, I mean, that just contradicts everything right off the bat. The materials are completely alien to us, and just the overall idea of the project is, hey, can we duplicate this with materials that we have here? So obviously it was something that was found, or given for that matter, and uh, we're just trying to duplicate it. So 115, where do you suppose it came from then? I mean, what, where, what kind of an environment would that kind of... The only element? place... Uh, the only place that 115 could be made would have to be in a natural situation somewhere maybe on the fringes of a supernova or somewhere around maybe a binary star system where there was more mass in the primordial mix of that of that system where heavier elements would have had a chance to form when the stars were collapsing and there were huge amounts of energy being uh, you know, released, uh, something along those lines. It has to be a naturally occurring element. All right, you saw antimatter reactors, you saw gravity propulsion systems in flying disks, flying saucers, you saw this element 115. You also read a series of reports that had other stunning information. Can you give an overview of the kinds of things that were in these reports? Uh, the reason I didn't do that before was, uh, first of all, they were just reports everything else I had hands-on experience with. Now, there was lots of strange information in the reports, but they were, again, it's just printed material, and uh, it could be disinformation. I don't know. But uh, certainly, the information I did read in the reports about the 115, the disagree, I mean, that all had, uh, you know, material that related to that. Uh, the reports went into uh, aliens and uh, even, even went along the lines of religious Background. Well, we should let our audience know. I mean, we discussed this when we were putting the, the series of reports together, what it, whether to get into the alien thing or not, and we decided not to for the time being. It's not like you're hiding something uh, from the audience or whatever. It was just, just a decision we made. But you did see uh, reports, whether they're true or not, government reports about aliens. What, yeah. what were in the reports? They had, well, there were photographs of aliens. There were autopsy reports. Uh, there was really a wealth of information, but there was, as, as far as what? What do they look like? The typical gray. Uh, I hate the to say that gray. like anyone knows what a typical gray is. It's a, it's a creature probably uh, three and a half to four feet tall, uh, a large hairless head, uh, black slanted eyes, long arms, uh, very thin looking. Uh, I don't know how else I would describe it. Well, what does an autopsy report look like? What, what's included in an autopsy report that you said you read? The reason I call it an autopsy report is I saw the uh, carcass, well, that was obviously a dead alien, the carcass cut up and uh, it was all dark inside, like it had an iron base. The reason I say iron is because it was very dark uh, blood or whatever. So I'm not a doctor, but uh, it seemed to be one large organ in the body as opposed to, you know, an identifiable heart and lungs and that sort of thing, but just one, one gooey mess in there. What did, what did the report say? I mean, it had pictures that had to have some words. Uh, here's Exhibit A, an alien? It, essentially so. They had weights and densities of the organs. That There were no conclusions drawn, but just, uh, it was just a basic description of what the person who was cutting, opening, uh, cutting open the body saw. Say where they came from? Yeah, in one of the reports it said they came from Reticulum 4 was what it said. Where is that? Any idea? <laughs> well, I'm told it's uh, a star system in uh, Zeta Reticuli. Reticulum is the constellation, uh, and by Reticulum 4, they meant the fourth planet out from that sun. In the same reports, we were identified, instead of saying Earth, we were identified as Sol 3, meaning the third planet out from our sun, the sun. So. Now, you've read a lot of UFO material. Do you find yourself mixing what you've read and what you, you learned from up there? No, that's why I stay away from the UFO researchers and things like that. I really don't want to be associated with that. I don't research the stuff. It's, it's interesting to read, but uh, no, I'm not mixing anything that I've read in, you know, in this stuff. We're going to get into that a little bit more. We're going to take a short break. Stay with us for more of On the Record left with Bob Lazar. We were just talking about the UFO field in general, and you feel a little reluctance to get mixed up in it, although you are right now. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, why, is, why the reluctance? Uh, 
I don't know. There are, there are many stories circulating around. Everyone has their own view. Each UFO researcher uh, says they have the right story. And uh, essentially, I don't want to side with anyone because, uh, you know, I don't know where that information's come from. Uh, though they do all have the basic story is, uh, you know, there are alien crafts here. Uh, how they got here is probably aliens brought them here, unless we have a really neat setup with UPS. Uh, you know, you really, there's just so many different factions of them, and they all kind of war between each other. I, I really don't want to get associated with them. Before you got into the, the program at S4, though, you had an interest in UFOs. I mean, it, it must be hard for people to swallow that here's a guy who has an interest in it, and he gets hired into the program. Well, that, it was a very brief time there. Uh, I had sent out resumes to several uh, places because I wanted to get back into the uh, scientific field again. Uh, it's almost simultaneously, I met John Lear and uh, read some of his material, and, and initially I thought he was just absolutely crazy. Uh, but apparently he did have a, a good source of information because, as it turns out, some of the information that he had I actually had hands-on experience with. Uh, but your regard for UFOs in general, I mean, as a scientist, did you think there was something to it? or was Absolutely it just not. A, absolutely no. nothing? No. I would have stood on that till the day I died, that that was bunk. Many of the people who, who've been calling are UFO groups or UFO researchers who have demanded that you talk to them. We've got to talk to this guy. Uh, we want to uh, give him a lot more publicity so he stays alive. Uh, we want him to give us information so that we can further check out his background, etc. Uh, we want to protect him. We want to help him. You've resisted. I mean, you've done this program. You've done uh, a couple of reports with us, and you've done a radio show or two. But in general, you've resisted going into the UFO circuit. Uh, why is that? Well, just like I mentioned before, I just don't want to be associated with those guys. Uh, and how many people are you going to open up your background to and let them, you know, run rampant through it? I mean, private detectives, every UFO group in the world want, wants to do that. The idea was for me to release the information, essentially to protect myself and take some of the heat off. And I've done that, and, uh, you know, that's all that, that needs to be done, really. Uh, certain, certain UFO researchers claim they've been getting information from you all along. You've been leaking stuff to them and that they've read these reports that verify the information. You've been working with UFO groups wh while you were in the program at S4? Not UFO groups. I did mention a couple things to some people. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. In, in essence, uh, were you breaking your, your vows that, uh, you know, that you made to the government? Yeah. And why, why did you feel that was necessary? I mean, you took an oath, didn't you? Yeah. But look at the magnitude of what was going on. I believe that some of the technology, it may be all of the technology should be kept secret until we have a handle on everything. But certainly the overview of what happened just cannot be a secret from, from anyone, not just the American people, but the rest of the world. Let out the basic fact that we have these crafts at one time. Uh, aliens did at least visit and drop off something, however they got here. Uh, that there was some contact made, and then cut it short. You don't need to release information on the gravity generators, the weapon potential, was, which is enormous, and, and so on. What could you do with that? we got about a minute left. What could you do with that technology? If, say, you took the flying disks, the antimatter reactors, the gravity generators, gave it to Los Alamos or Livermore, let them examine the potential abilities of this stuff, I mean, how, how would it affect life on Earth if this stuff was widely available? And mass-producible? Yeah. That's tough to say. I mean, you have uh, different, a completely different mode of travel. Uh, what happens when you can play with time? Uh, that gets into a, a, a really <laughs> deep philosophical, you know, question there. But I mean, we could. It would change a lot of stuff. Change everything. Oh yeah, it would change absolutely everything. Think it'll ever come out? Personally, no. What do you hope happens, both to yourself and with this information? Uh, that there's been enough thorns put in their toes to where they do try and release something. We'll have to have you come back, Bob. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week with more of On the Record.